It was high noon in the valley of the shadow When the deep of the valley was bright When the mouth of the tomb shouted glory The groom is alive So long you wages of sin Go on, don't you come back again I've been raised and redeemed You've lost all your sting To the victor of the battle High noon in the valley In the valley of the shadow Now the demons, they danced in the darkness when that last ragged breath left his lungs And they reveled and howled At the war that they thought they had won But then in the dark of the grave The stone rolled away From the still of the dawn On the greatest of days High noon in the valley of the shadow when the shadows were shot through with the light When Jesus took in that breath And shattered all death with his life So long you wages of sin Go on, don't you come back again I've been raised and redeemed You've lost all your sting to the victor of the battle Hallelujah. I noon in the valley In the valley of the shadow Let the people rejoice Let the heavens resound People rejoice let the name of Jesus who sought us and freed us forever ring out. All praise to the fighter of the night who rides on the light, whose gun is the grace of the God of the sky. In the valley of the shadows, when the shadows were shot through with light, when the mouth of the tomb shouted glory, the groom is alive. So long, you wages of sin, I said, go on, don't you come back again. I've been raised and redeemed, you will praise to the king, the victor of the battle. I knew in the valley of the shadow in the valley of the shadow in the power of Jesus yeah. now it is finished people rejoice it is finished Sing with us. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. Amen. All right. I uh, just want to say a couple quick things here before we get started. I'm kind of the 
I'm, I'm sort of the anti-salesman. I'm, I'm very conscientious about uh, not ever coming off as a promoter. I've, I've seen that done too many times when ministers sort of employ their uh, spiritual uh, credibility in ways that uh, sort of monetize the gospel, and I, I, I really have an aversion to that. And so uh, I do this with a great deal of trepidation, but I just want to let you know that uh, we do have a couple books, that uh, one that's been written by me. It's a book I'm very excited about. Um, I'll talk about that one first. It's a book I've just written last year. It's called God in Pain, Another Look at Evil, Suffering, and the Cross. And it's my attempt to explain in philosophical and theological terms, also I think pastoral terms, um, the great controversy. That was the book that really impacted me, and it's sort of... Why is, there, why is the world in the condition that it is in? And uh, I think that uh, the cross is at the center of that, and a God who is in pain is at the center of that. And uh, 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 Clifford uh, Goldstein wrote the foreword for it. It's a book I'm very proud of, not because it's so great, but because I think it's a very fair articulation of the scriptural presentation. And so um, we have, I have that book. We don't actually have that one with us, but if you are interested in that, we'll take uh, your... Uh, uh, address or uh, information at the back, and then you can, uh, I'll ship it to you for free if, if you want to do that. Um, the other book uh, that I'm very excited about is, uh, happens to be a book on my story. Um, it's called Twice Upon a Time, and you'll notice this very handsome gentleman here. Hmm? Uh, this is really a remarkable story. It's called The David Asherick and Nathan Renner Story. Um, uh, many of you would have heard, and I might have mentioned here, that I was sort of uh, converted, uh, one, out of a, a punk rock situation. I was a purple-haired, tattooed, pierced punk rocker, and uh, through a series of wonderful, fortuitous, providential, and in some ways circuitous uh, events, uh, I became a believer, a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, the great thing is, is that it was uh, Joshua, when he shared the book with me. Joshua, where are you? Looking for you here. I know I saw you. I'm not going to call you up front, so you don't have to be afraid of that. I can't see him. Anyway, he's somewhere around here. Um, he's just afraid, that's all. Um, <laughs> after I was converted, after he had given me the great controversy and studied the Bible with me, uh, I was on fire, uh, understandably. Still am on fire, by the way. And uh, wanted to go share uh, the message that I had learned with many of my punk rock friends. I was involved in bands, and in our little punk rock community was a very influential person, which is like saying that you had a bunch of teenagers as friends. Um, but anyway, we had the privilege, Joshua and I, of studying uh, the Bible with many of our punk rock friends. And uh, the good news is, is that one, two, three, four of our former punk rock community are now Seventh-day Adventist ministers. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, so my, my best friend in the world is, uh, apart from my wife and Jesus, of course, is this man here. His name is Nathan Renner. Does anyone here know Nathan? Have you heard that name before? Okay. Nathan Renner, if, if, you, ever, if you heard me preach, um, you would think it was Nathan. And if you heard Nathan preach, you'd think it was me. Literally, our, our affect, our talk, our, we even look similar, which is why we called it Twice Upon a Time. There are numerous times where I will call Nathan's house, and his wife's name is Becky, and she'll answer the phone, and she'll say... Hello, the Renners, and I'll say, hey, Beck, and she'll say, hey, sweetie. <laughs> no. Um, but anyway, the, the, the similarities between us are really quite remarkable. People ask us all the time if we're brothers, and the answer is yes, we're brothers in Christ. But Nathan and I have known one another for years, and he was one of my closest punk rock friends. And uh, today he's my senior pastor. How many people can say that they won the first Bible study I ever gave uh, was to my senior pastor? And uh, not a lot of people can say that they won their senior pastor to Jesus. And uh, so anyway, this is the story of uh, my story and Nathan's story and also the other two. Uh, there's more than that, but uh, there's four of us that have become ministers. And uh, I think it's a great story. We didn't write it ourselves. We wanted to be as objective as possible. So we got a good friend of ours, Jennifer Jill Schwerzer. She writes uh, for the Adventist Review. She writes sometimes for Liberty. And uh, I think it's a great book. It's complete with um, pictures. So uh, if you want to see the before pictures, this book is also available. So uh, anyway, it's a great story, not because it's my story, but because it's God's story. Amen? So uh, th those books will be available at the back if you have an interest in that. I just want to thank you so much for the privilege of having been here this week. This has been a blessing for me. 
and uh, I hope it has been a, a blessing for you. Uh, I will get on a plane today, I will fly back to California, and in a, just a few short days I'll be back in New Zealand, and I honestly and earnestly solicit your prayers for the meetings that we are recommencing there in Christchurch in the midst of a very difficult uh, situation. Will you pray for us? I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to pray, you know, a hundred times, just once, just once. Uh, pray for us that the Spirit of God will come down upon those meetings and upon um, me as I preach, and that God will give me the right words. It's going to be a very delicate, difficult situation um, to speak into that, and I just want to have the right balance of where is God in all of this. And uh, it's the exact kind of thing, this, this earthquake, that I wrote the book about to try and understand natural evil and, uh, uh, of course, the, 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 the great controversy motif. So anyway, without further ado, I just solicit your prayers. I want to have a quick prayer and get into our presentation today, which is very simple. Very simple. I'm not going to say very short, by the way, which I have learned not to say. Please. Oh, yeah. You want my toothbrush? Oh, yeah. You can have that. Thank you. It was, it was in this pocket, so I thought I'd, you know, I, I thought I'd done right there, but uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Hope Channel. <laughs> it reminds me of a book that John Piper wrote a number of years ago, Brethren, We Are Not Professionals. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Lord, for that. I did pray for humility this morning. <laughs> Remind me to stop praying for that. Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a privilege, what a blessing it has been to be here and to bask in your presence. Uh, Father, we come to you this morning as redeemed Randys and redeemed Ronalds and redeemed Richards and redeemed Peters. Father, we come to you believing that there is a place at the table for even prodigals and that there is a place at the table even for pouty, pathetic older brothers. And Father, we come uh, this morning believing that the kingdom of heaven is based on righteousness and love and grace. And so please, Father, you have brought us to a place um, in our experiences through a variety of wonderful and, and different and, and unique journeys. Uh, here we are, we stand before you. And I pray that somehow in these next several moments that you would give me the words to speak uh, to a people that, that need to hear. We need to hear from you, Father. The preached word is your ordained means to communicate the gospel to the world, one of those means. And so we just pray that you'll be with us today. Speak to our hearts, not through a preacher, but through the word preached. And uh, certainly uh, through the power and the indwelling of your spirit. Be not only in this building, Father, that would not be sufficient. Uh, we ask that you would be in our hearts. We claim the promise this morning of Romans 8, 15, that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God. And Father, this morning by faith we receive the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. Be with us now is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. So we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven and we have been talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, just by way of sort of setting the context here, I'm just going to read another quick statement here. We've, we've read this one before, but I just want to review it. Speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, she writes in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 147, his words had struck at the very root of their former ideas and opinions. To obey his teaching, Jesus' teaching, would require a change in all of their habits of thought and action. It would bring them into collision with their religious teachers, for it would involve, and here's that revolutionary language here, it would involve the overthrow of the whole structure which for generations the rabbis had been rearing. And so we said that when Jesus stood there no longer as a carpenter, he's laid aside the saw, he's laid aside the hammer, he's laid aside the tape measure. When Jesus stands on the new Mount Sinai, the new covenant Sinai, the Mount of Blessing, he stands giving not only a revelatory message, which it certainly was, but a revolutionary message. That language is absolutely quintessential revolutionary language, that, that his message, the, the adherence and the acceptance of his message, the inculcation of his message would require an overthrow, listen to that language, of the structure that for generations the rabbis had been rearing. Jesus had the temerity and the audacity to stand as the promised one, as the Messiah before Israel and say radical things, things like, and this refrain is repeated some six times, we've mentioned it already, you have heard 
but what? But I say, you have heard, but I say. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lusteth after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You have been hearing, but I have something different to say. What you have heard from your rabbis, what you have heard from your religious instructors, what you have heard from the scribes is different from what I am saying. And you will recall right there at the end of the message, this is uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, what was the response of the people to what Jesus said? What was the word that scripture used there? It said when people heard, when he had ended all these teachings, the people were what? What was that word? They were astonished. They were astonished. That's verse 28. And then verse 29 told us the source of their astonishment. What was the source of their astonishment? For he taught them what? As one having authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. And, and I remind you again that one of the difficulties, one of the great difficulties that we as a 21st century people face is reading the Bible through first century ears and through first century eyes, trying to understand the Bible in its original context. And for those of us that know how the story ends, we know the high noon. We know that Jesus not only went into the tomb, but he came out of the tomb. But let's try to hear those words. Hear the radicalness and the revolutionary nature of those words as we sit there on the, the Galilean hillside and as we listen. Our thoughts would have been something like, who does this guy think he is? I mean, what, who, who, who is he? He's young, he's relatively unknown. I mean, who is he to talk like this? The people were astonished at the clarity and the directness and the authority of his message. That's what the Bible says. Now, we opened with the Beatitudes. Jesus, of course, commences uh, uh, by saying the very opening line thought about for the better part of 20 years. Blessed are the what? Blessed are the um, poor in spirit, for there is what? is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that recognize their, their spiritual poverty because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that recognize their spiritual poverty because heaven was made for people just like them. Can you say amen to that? Now, that's the opening. That's the opening of the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, we don't have time for a full exposition of the whole Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7. We don't have time for that. But what we have done is we're going to look at the bookends. We opened with the Beatitudes. We walked through that Beatitudinal sequence. Absolutely beautiful. Is the kingdom of heaven at the beginning and all the way at the end? Blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For there's what? Is the kingdom of heaven. The message here is clear. It's unmistakable that wherever you are in this sequence, wherever you are in this Beatitudinal ladder, if you have put faith in Jesus and you have come to him as a sinner, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Can we say amen to that? So what we are going to do, because we don't have time to go to the rest of Matthew chapter 5 and the rest of Matthew chapter 6 and the rest of Matthew chapter 7, we are going to go to how Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount. Which, incidentally, in the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, uh, Ellen White basically says that if all we had, we have 66 books in the Bible and, and uh, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, she says if all we had was the Sermon on the Mount. She says we, have more, we would have more than enough to be saved and to have a right conception of God and his character. If, if, if that was all we had, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. So n a number of years ago when I first read that, I thought, wow, that means that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is like a mini Bible. The Sermon on the Mount is like a mini Bible, and I don't know, I've, I hear stories, you know, I don't know if they're urban legends or, or genuine, but you hear stories about, you know, J.N. Andrews and others who had memorized, you know, the whole New Testament. Is that true? Can anyone confirm that? It is true. I believe that. I mean, the whole New Testament? Uh, wow. So I sort of did the, the, the introductory version. Um, I memorized the Sermon on the Mount. That seemed a little more... Uh, that was, a, that was a something I could bite off and understand and chew. So Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. Because I thought, someday, if anyone ever takes this away... If they take it from me, they can't take this from me. Right? They can't take this from me. That's why I want to hide the word of God in my heart. So Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. And I've spent probably the better part of my religious experience not just trying to understand these words. That's one thing. That's cerebral. That's between the ears. I have been trying to apply Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. And let me tell you, that's tough. It's tough to live that way. Love those who curse you. Pray for your enemies and bless them that despise you. Ah, ah. Are we together on that? And so it's one thing to understand, it's another thing to apply. And by the power of the Spirit, I want to be one of those people who not only knows and has memorized and who knows where to find the Sermon on the Mount. Oh yeah, that's Matthew 5. I want to be somebody who lives the Sermon on the Mount. So when Jesus brings this to a close, let's go see what he does. 
Let's go see how he brings this to a close. Matthew chapter 7, this is just before Matthew records for us the response of the people, their astonishment. Matthew chapter 7, and he closes it in a familiar way. Many of us would be absolutely familiar with this. We'll pick it up in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the what? Say it with me. The kingdom of heaven. And what are the three principles upon which the kingdom of heaven is based? It was love, grace, and righteousness. Totally unlike all of those kingdoms that we saw the other day. Valuable kingdoms, wonderful kingdoms. And in a fallen world, many of them as good as we're going to get. But Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is based on love, grace, and righteousness. Love, grace, and righteousness. So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of love, grace, and righteousness. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them some of the most painful and, and, and poignant verses in all of Scripture. I never, what's the next word? Knew you. And then, and then tr- just the next word is just difficult to even say, I'm sure for Jesus more than for us. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. And then what Jesus does is he encapsulates the whole of what he has said in an analogy, in a simile. And it's a simile that, that you learned if you were raised in a Christian home. I've, I taught it to my children. Right? When, when they were very young, they could sing, The wise man built his house upon the walk. Right? They were singing it from a very young age. Verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a what kind of a man? A wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him to a what kind of man? Foolish man who built his house on the... And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. This is how Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount. It is just after this that Matthew records that the people were greatly astonished because he taught them not as the scribes and Pharisees but as somebody who had authority... Now think about that for just a moment. Jesus here has the temerity not only to say, you have been hearing, but I say. You have heard, but I stay. I stand in contradiction and contradistinction to your religious instructors and even in many ways to your religious traditions. I say something else. But he brings the whole thing to this grand climax by saying, if you listen to what I'm saying and do it, you're wise. And if you don't, you're foolish. Quite a temeritous thing for somebody who's 27, 28, 29 years old to say. What a radical thing. Think of how that would have resonated with the people there, not through 21st century years, but first century years. Your response would have probably been, who does this guy think he is? Who is this? Who is this mystery man that talks like this? If you listen to what I say, you're like a man who builds his house on the rock, and if you don't listen to what I say, you're like a man who builds his house on the sand? Radical stuff. Not just revelatory, but absolutely revolutionary. Now, what I'd like to do, frankly, just because it's easier to preach from this passage, is invite you to go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is also, uh, this is Luke's uh, uh, version of the close of the Sermon on the Mount. And there is a phrase here that I want to hone in on. So let's go to Luke chapter 6 and see how Luke communicates the, 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 and Jesus likely said these things over and over again. And so it's quite likely that he might have communicated them in both ways. And I want to look at Luke's translation, Luke's version, rather, of this. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the what? On the rock, and when the flood rose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, For it was founded on the rock, verse 49. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth, and here's our three-word phrase, without a foundation. Without a foundation. Let's say those three words together, if you would. Without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell... And the ruin of that house was great. Jesus here, and I like Luke's account because he says, the wise man built his house on the foundation of the rock. But the foolish man built his house, what are our three words, everyone? Without a foundation. I just want to ask a very simple, simple, simple question. What is the purpose of a foundation? 
okay, to anchor a structure. Anybody else? Why do we put foundations under our houses? Anybody? Just nice and loud so I can hear you. To make the house strong. Okay, anybody else want to add to that? To keep it from moving. Okay, as to support the structure. Anybody want to add to that? What, what stability? Okay, keep coming. It makes the rest of the house what it's going to be. Okay, anybody else? To keep the... Oh, to keep the termites out. Yeah, that's, I'm, very, I'm very sensitive to that living in California as I do. Uh, very good. Okay, I'm going to suggest to you that fundamentally... The reason, I follow this very carefully, it's simple but I believe profound. Incidentally, is Jesus here giving architectural advice? Is this his concern, building codes? No. So Jesus here is obviously employing a simile. He's employing an analogy. Even a more simple question, just by way of parenthesis. What is a house for? What do we do in houses? We live. Right? That's right. That's, that's where we live. We, we sleep there. We eat there. We do, we do many of us work there. We spend time with our family there. In fact, we even have a room in our house called the living room. Which is kind of a funny name for a, ho- a room, isn't it? Oh, welcome to the living room. Let's go live. Hmm. It kind of makes you, what, what, you know, makes you wonder what happens when you leave that room. You know, I'm just, just tired of living. You know? So... The point is is that obviously Jesus is employing a very simple, very understandable, my kids get this, a house is for living. So Jesus here is not primarily concerned with building codes or any other such thing. Jesus' concern is with the life. He's using it as an analogy. A house is where we live. It's where we, it's where we grow up. It's, it's, it's where we sleep. It's, it's better than a tent. It keeps the termites out. All of these things, it's a house. Okay. So Jesus here is not primarily concerned with building codes or any other such thing. He gives us advice on a foundation. He says the wise men put down a foundation. I've asked you many reasons, and you've given some great ones, by the way, all of which I think are valid. But let me suggest to you this. The reason that we put foundations under our homes is because what appears to be solid isn't. You with me? If you were to walk out, if we were to go out this door right here, and walk out down here onto the terra firma, you can see it, we're just at ground level right here. If we were to walk out there and, and try this experiment, if you'd like, it's very scientific, and uh, if you were to, to, to get out onto just a field, a playing field of grass or of cobblestone or anything, and you were to go... Could you, has the earth ever moved under you? Doesn't happen very easily, does it? And some of you feel like it's happening because you're getting a little bigger in the, in the waist. And, uh, whoo, won't talk about that. But, but the point is, is that if you try to, as a general rule, the earth doesn't move. You move. So the earth has the appearance of solidity, but not its substance. The reason, friends, that we put, the reason that we put, <laughs> I'm glad I was able to pull that off, Don't encourage me. Don't, I'll be jumping over things. <laughs> the reason that we put foundations in our homes is because that which appears to be solid isn't. The earth possesses the appearance of solidity, but not its substance. Seismic shifts, and I've just experienced one. Let me tell you, the earth that appears to be absolutely solid can go liquid in a moment. Not only seismic, but seasonal shifts. Things like erosion and the wind and the rain. The Bible actually cites the floods rose and and, and the the, the wind beat against that house. And so we put foundations under our house very simply for the very simple, most basic, rudimentary reason. Not only to define the basic parameters of the house, but because that which appears to be solid really isn't. What the foundation does is the foundation moderates and mitigates the shifts that take place on the earth. Which appear, again, to have solidity but which really don't so the foundation acts as a barrier a buffer a moderator between us and that which is shifting now let's just ask some very simple questions pastoral questions what are some of the things because we're not talking about building codes what are some of the things that people are inclined and do build their lives on that have the appearance of solidity but lack its substance. Money. Let's start there. Great one. Money. Okay. 
we here in the Western world, many of us being here from the United States or from other uh, countries that uh, have had uh, traditionally a more robust economy, um, we got accustomed to thinking. We thought that the big decisions in life were which SUV to buy. I mean, this was really important stuff. And we were on the Internet, and is it going to be, you know, the Nissan Armada, or is it going to be the Toyota Sequoia? And we thought this was very important stuff. And did we go with the leather, you know, the sunroof? I just, I don't know, I'm going to mix it up. We'd be online. And this was important stuff. We thought that the most important stuff was which SUV to buy. Or not maybe the most important stuff, but, but our lives were really oriented around, should I get a second house, maybe a rental property? And, and we, we had plans, and we had retirement, we had a, all of this here in America. And then, oh, not so long ago, about four or five years ago, something we had a bit of a Things began to move a little bit. And that, that thing, the American dollar, the U.S. dollar, the gold standard, so to speak, that, that appeared to, to be so solid and, and was really, we thought, the foundation of the global economy begins to move. When this was happening, I was living in Detroit. And uh, I want to thank the Lord for the clarity that the Michigan Conference had when this began to happen. Because frankly, um, it was a time for outright panic for the church. When I first moved uh, to Detroit, uh, just to give you a feel for Michigan, Michigan has, per capita in the United States, state by state, the highest uh, percentage of boat ownership. Now you might be thinking, big deal. Well, do you know who buys boats? People that can afford them. <laughs> right? People that buy boats are people that can afford them. And of all of the states, the highest percentage of boat ownership is Michigan. It's Michigan. Of course, you have a boat. You're out on the lakes. You're having a good time. You're water skiing. You're duck hunting. You're fishing. We're in our boat. Hey, let's go out to the, to the lake this weekend in our boat. Highest percentage of boat ownership because... For years and years and years and years and years and years, Detroit has been, uh, in many ways, a breadbasket of the United States economy because the big three are there. Ford, Ford, built Ford tough. GM, Chrysler, all there. And the economy is robust and the economy is strong. And then Honda happens. Then Toyota happens. Then Mitsubishi happens, and increasingly Hyundai is happening. And now I just talked to my friend, uh, a, a good friend of mine. I've, many of our friends, of course, still there in the Detroit area. Just talked to him the other day. He's a, he's a great man. His name is Vladimir Levchenkov, and he was a skater uh, with the Russian national team. Uh, just an amazing man. I had the privilege of baptizing him. He became a believer. Just an awesome story. And uh, he works on, he's a body man, right? He's, he works on, on cars. And I said to him, hey, Vladimir, how are things going? Well, of course, his business is tanked. People, mass exodus out of Detroit. Mass exodus, people looking for jobs. So many things happening there. And Vladimir said to me, he said, I'll tell you what it's like here. He said, there is no traffic here anymore. Now, when I first got to Detroit, you had to be very careful about when you drove and where you drove and the times you drove. He said, David, you can drive downtown at any time of the day, and there is no traffic jams anymore. There's just no people. Now, the Michigan economy, uh, the governor of Michigan and everybody else is trying to do their best to infuse in various ways uh, monies back into the system. And praise the Lord for the Michigan conference. They, had the, they, they, they realize that their confidence is not in Ford, it's not in GM, it's not in Chrysler. Even though many of the tithe-paying constituents of that conference were automotive engineers, they had their faith in God, not in the big three. Can you say amen? But the point is this, th what happened to that economy? What happened to Detroit? Detroit today, today, Detroit has the largest number of condemned buildings of any, of any city of size in the U.S. by far. Just went yesterday to the uh, museum, the uh, fine art, uh, the contemporary art museum there, I think it's called the Hershon. Is that right? Is that right? It's downtown Washington here. You guys live here. <laughs> it's a museum. Am I saying that right? Hirschhorn, thank you, very kind. I was beginning to wonder if I was really there. Um, <laughs> so one of the displays, um, most of which I was just like, all right, moving on. But there, there was one particular display that was fascinating, and it all this whole video movie was shot in these dilapidated buildings of Detroit. What's happened to this economy? What's happened? Well, I'll tell you what's happened. The U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy appeared to be solid, but it's not. 
There are people by the thousands that had built their lives on the solidity and stability of the U.S. automotive industry in, in particular and the, world, the, the United States economy in general. People build their lives on this. They come home and you've been laid off. Look at what's happening right now in Wisconsin and in other places. The unions are going insane. Well, all of that is a microcosm of a much larger macrocosm that the United States is shifting. It's shaking. There's talk, as you know right now, in the, in the global e economies that to shift away from the U U.S. dollar as the standard. And to what are we going to shift to now? Because it's, it's, there's too much. Now, I'm not one of these doomsdayists. I'm not one of these people that thinks that the United States economy is going to absolutely tank. I don't think it can based on our understanding of prophecy. Because we are told that national apostasy precedes national ruin. We're told that. Let's just be clear about that. But, but is there going to be a time of shifting? Is there going to be a time of sh Absolutely. We're seeing it. I guess the message here is don't build your life around an industry. Don't build your life around the United States economy or any other economy. What's something else that people build their lives on that has the appearance of solidity but lacks the substance thereof? Careers, great one. People get fired all the time. It happens. People get fired, people lose their jobs, and I want to be sensitive to this. I mean, it's a very difficult thing. My brother was, my brother was a big shot uh, corporate guy in downtown San Francisco. He's not yet a believer. Uh, pray for him. I write about him in the book. I, I, I love him. He's very, very dear to me. I was just resonating so much, Derek, with what you said about your brother, how you just got to love them because if they don't turn, this is the only life they're going to get. So we just need to pour love upon them. And I'm doing that. And I, I see glimmers of hope. Um, but my brother, he's, he's got the great job. He's got the dream job. He's working corporate office, downtown San Francisco, making very good money. I mean, you better be making good money when you pay $2,800 a month rent for a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment. Ugh. And you thought housing here was expensive. Woo! And then one day I get this email from my brother, uh, went in today, lost my job. It's different when it's your brother. When everybody else is losing the job, it's, it's, it's them. They lost their job. But when it's your brother, it hurts. My brother's confused and trying to advise him and, and in a spiritual way, but without coming off as, and what do you do? People build their lives around their careers. People build their lives around money. People build their lives around the economy. And, and I'm trying to steer my brother in, in gracious and, and, and fraternal ways toward a better foundation. What's something else that people build their lives around that has the appearance of solidity but lacks the substance thereof? Relationships is a huge one. Thank you, Lee. Huge. Not only uh, relationships pre-marriage, but how many people, how many people in this room have gone through a divorce? Don't raise your hands. I'm the child of divorce. I've never met my father. Never. I've shaken his hand one time, but I didn't know it was him. Fascinating story. I performed the funeral of my grandfather, and my grandfather had gotten my father, his name was Frank Cross, a job on the Union Pacific Railroad in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and there was about 60 or 70 people there in the auditorium when I performed the funeral. It was the greatest honor of my life. He was the, the best man I ever knew. Not a believer externally, but certainly a Christ-like man in his, in his practice. And I, I got to do the funeral. It was a great joy, a great privilege for me to be able to honor my grandfather in that way. And so as, as people were coming out past the little chapel, I mean, the chapel would have been this big, just like here, just like this right here. This is the chapel. People are filing out, and I'm good, thank you for coming, going by the coffin, thank you for coming, going by the coffin. And uh, when we get outside and get into the, uh, the car, my mom says to me, my mother, my biological mother, she says to me, did you see Frank? I'm like, what? Did you see Frank? Frank was here. Really? That's my dad. Never met him. He left when I was three weeks old. She says, yeah, I was sitting in the third row in the red sweater. I shook his hand. He knows who I am. I shook my dad's hand and never knew who he was. Are you with me on that? Beloved, listen to me. As a child of divorce, I can tell you that even the most stable marriage can, can and, and heaven forbid that it happen, can crumble apart. And many people build their whole lives around the solidity of a relationship. And I, let me just open my heart to you as ministers. I'll tell you, there's a burden on my heart, and that is, I don't want to go into too many details here, but I counseled with some very godly, very well-known ministers early in my ministry, and they expressed to me in the most emphatic of language, do not lose your children. 
Do not lose your children. Keep your children close to you. And so for me, I decided early on in my ministry, for me, that I was not going to sacrifice my kids on the altar of ministry. That's just not going to be me. Now, for those of you that might have lost your children and your children are presently out of the church, let me just give you a word of encouragement here. The Father in heaven lost a third of his children. He did nothing wrong. Stop blaming yourself. The Father in heaven had a third of his own angelic children rebel against him. Are you with me on that? Okay. But for me, I was absolutely committed to my children being with me. My children are going to, I want them to, I don't want them to see me saving the world and ignoring them. We together on that? I want to keep my kids close to me. By the grace of God, I want to keep my wife close to me. Nine times out of ten, she travels with me, and that's something I'm committed to. Absolutely committed to it. I don't trust myself, frankly. I'll just be honest with you. I just don't trust myself. You might be stronger than me. You might be a, a better man than me. Your, my, your wife might have her own career. But in my ministry, uh, we just decided that my wife, in as much as it was possible, was going to travel with me. Now, there are places that invite us to come. And, oh, David, we'd love to have you come. Oh, great. You know, my wife travels with me. Oh, you know, that's not in the budget. No problem. I'm sure you'll find a speaker that'll do a great job. I'm sure that he'll be a blessing, and I'll pray that... Why don't we pray right now that God will help you to find a great speaker? So, so and that's not just because I'm some, you know, weak, fleshly, carnal individual. It's because my wife is a part of my ministry, and I want her to feel invested, and I want her to feel involved, and I want her to be part. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying here that this has to be your situation. This is my situation, but I am saying this... Whether your wife does or does not travel with you, whether your kids are or are not close to you, in as much as it's possible, keep your family close to you. But even when you do everything right, the world can still fall apart. Even when you do everything right, the world can still fall apart. Do not invest yourself in an absolute sense in another person, in a relationship other than your relationship with God. Because relationships and marriages have the appearance of solidity, especially when you've been married. I've, 12 years, we're coming up on our 12-year anniversary. Many of you, more than that, many more years than that. My grandparents, if my grandfather would have lived four months longer, would have celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. Hallelujah. Ha, just beautiful. Uh, incidentally, uh, anyway, I, don't, I won't get into that. But anyway, so relationships. Another thing, let me just throw this one out. Health. Every person in this room is one visit to the doctor away from your body being riddled with cancer. Some of you in this room, no doubt, have already had an experience with cancer. In fact, I just met one uh, two days ago. You see, right now, as far as I know, I'm cancer-free, but I try to stay away from the doctor. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't, go, I don't go in for these regular checkups. I, I just, it's just not part of who I am. I still feel like I'm young, and, and I, just, I feel like it will be conceding the battle to go in for these regular checkups at this point. It's like the admission that I've reached middle age, and it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> but the point is this. Uh, you go in, and you think you're healthy, and the doctor says to you, um, have a seat. You don't know. Life, we take for granted. Our health, we take for granted. Wasn't it Thomas Jefferson that said, might have been him, may not have been, that your, your, your liberty is like your health. You don't really miss it until it's gone. See, we take our health for granted. We feel invincible, many of us. Have you ever noticed, as you're driving down the freeway, that the cars that are on the side of the road with, with bodies hanging out of them are always other people? Have you ever noticed that it's not you? It's always somebody else that's dead on the side of the road. It's never you. This creates in us a sense of almost invincibility. Dying is something that happens to others. Right? It's never been us that we... I've not died yet. Right? And this fact that I've never died yet gives every one of us a sense in this room, especially those of us that are younger. It's, it happens... It's absolutely linear. You know, when, you feel, when you're 19, 20, 25, you feel invincible. You feel like you'll never die. Right? And, and you get to be a little older, you think, well, maybe I'll die. It could happen. Right? But the reality is, is that every one of us, in the words of Richard O'Phil, are old age positive. Every one of us is diagnosed. We're old age positive. We're all heading in that direction. One visit from the doctor away. One visit from being told that you have some terrible disease. You see, friends, your health and even your life, we need a foundation that can overcome not only the vicissitudes of our health, but what about death itself? 
The great question of life and the great question of philosophy, it's always somebody else who's dead, but the person who's dead on the side of the road felt as invincible as you do right up until the moment that they died. You see, friends, what Jesus is saying here is that the man that, the man that was wise, he built his house on a foundation because the foundation mitigates and moderates the shifts in that which appears to be solid, but which isn't. We need to be careful on what are we actually building our lives upon, the stability and the solidity of our lives. Is it on money? Is it on an economy? Is it on a governmental system? Is it on a relationship? Is it on, uh, 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 is it on our health? Is it on, a, uh, there's so many, is it on our career? Is it on our education? The foundation, the only foundation that can moderate the actual seismic and seasonal shifts, the radical seismic and seasonal shifts of life is the word of God. Because when everything else shifts, when everything else shifts, it doesn't. Now, keep that in your mind and just travel with me very briefly. Stay in the Gospel of Luke. Go to Luke 14. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. If you ever made this comparison, but I think it is a fascinating one, absolutely worthy of your attention. Luke chapter 14. Jesus here is telling a parable, and uh, in the parable, he is describing a man, a man who's going to build, a builder. Now, we'll pick it up in Luke chapter 14, and we'll begin in verse 28. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you intending to build a, what does your Bible say? A tower or a building. For which of you, Jesus is asking a question, for which of you intending to build a tower, a building, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient to, what does your Bible say? Finish it. Now watch verses 29 and 30. This is fascinating. Lest, after he has, what has he done? Laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. Verse 30, saying, this man began to build but was not able to... Now watch this. Fascinating, I think. Fascinating. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus, con Jesus ushers a warning, a stern warning against a man who has a house with no foundation. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus issues a similarly severe warning against those who have a foundation with no house. In one case, a houseless foundation. In another, a foundationless house. Both are mistakes. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. What could be the pastoral lesson that we could tease out of this? What's the pastoral lesson that we could draw out of this analogy, this, this, this juxtaposition of a, a, a foundationless house and a houseless foundation? I think it is this. In the words of Ellen White, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 148. Listen very carefully. The Word of God is the only sure foundation our world knows. The Word of God is the only sure sure foundation our world knows, okay? So, for many of us, we are building our lives on the foundation of the word. In the sense that we believe it. In the sense that we, we were raised, perhaps, in a Seventh-day Adventist home. We learned in Sabbath school. We have a great foundation, basic biblical foundation. We were raised in a good situation. We intellectually assent to many of the truths of Scripture. We know the hymns. We go to potluck, we go to church. Our life has a good start, a good start. And so our, our basic worldview is, is there. It's our foundation. But simply believing that the Bible is the word of God, simply believing that it is the epistemological foundation for knowledge, simply believing these things is not a life. You see, friends, not only is it about having a, a foundation, it's about building your life on that foundation. How many people are in our churches for whom their, the, the sum total of their religious experience is that they got a good start? It doesn't work itself out in actual, tangible ministry experience and reaching out to others and actual daily time with Jesus. Saying that they're a Seventh-day Adventist is like saying they're Italian. It's a cultural commitment. They've got a good start. It's, 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 it's a totally cultural reality. They have a start, but there's no life that is built on top of this. But the other mistake is equally terrible. The other mistake is equally, is equally dangerous. And that is to have a whole life that has no foundation. No foundation. People are... Beloved, 
the, the rich depth of the philosophical nature of the biblical worldview is not sufficiently appreciated by many in our general ranks and probably even many in leadership positions. Beloved, we are at war here. There is a cultural war that is taking place and everybody is looking for an epistemological bedrock. Everybody. What we mean by that is everybody's looking for something that is certain. Something that they can say. And postmodernism says the certainty is that nothing is certain. Right? And there have been, there's postmodernism and modernism. We can get into all of those details. But right now, there is a war being waged. And, and, and basically, in, in very simple language, there is a war again of, of theism versus materialism. Materialism, this is the evolutionary worldview that basically says there are two things in existence in the universe, matter and energy. Matter and energy. That is the sum total of, of everything that exists in the universe is constructed either of matter or of energy. Well, if everything in the universe is made either of matter or of energy, then this, this absolutely in, in, a, in a necessary way rules out the existence of immaterial objects. Things like mm, God, angels, the soul, spirits. And there's a war that's taking place here. Two totally different ways of understanding reality. Two totally different worldviews, two totally different ways of viewing the world around us. Seventh-day Adventists have historically taken a biblical worldview. That, what that means is, is that we have chosen to view what takes place in the world through Scripture. Scripture is how we view what is taking place. Everything that takes place is understood in a scriptural context. And to be more uh, specific to Seventh-day Adventists, it takes place through the lens of the great controversy. This ba battle, this cosmic battle, well, this is foolishness to the mind of many academicians and modern intellectuals. This is, this is philosophical nonsense. It's foolishness because they're coming from a totally different place. They don't come from a biblical perspective or from a biblical worldview. Many of them are approaching uh, the, the, the answers to these various philosophical and, and other questions from a totally materialistic point. Their starting point is a totally different starting point. Trying to import or to incorporate many of their conclusions when their basic starting point and foundation is t at absolute antithetical philosophical odds with our own is, is intellectual, philosophical, and experiential suicide. We don't view the world the way they view it. Why would we try to import their basic thesis? Are we together? I, I mean, to me, this is, just, this is just basic. I was in Dr. Donkor's office yesterday. I mean, the reality is this. And I want to just go on record as saying, as a pastor who's in the field, as a minister who's in the field, uh, the, the depth and level of appreciation in my soul for the BRI cannot be sufficiently communicated in words. Uh, the, the men uh, that make up this institution, and women I'm sure as well at, at some level, the men and women that make up this institution, I cannot say enough good about what they are doing for the world church. I, I want to thank Dr. Rodriguez. I know he's approaching retirement. I don't, I don't know if he's here today, but I want to thank him publicly for the impact that he has had on my life and Dr. Fondle and, and uh, Dr. Diop and, and uh, Dr. Donker that I met yesterday. Dr. Stella's getting ready to take over this position. Beloved to me, and it's not just the BRI. Of course, we have many wonderful scholars even outside of the Biblical Research Institute. Can you say amen to that? But beloved to me, there is, there is, that we need people on the cutting edge of, of theological and philosophical inquiry that can give us solid biblical answers to see that there are two radically different views of the world at, at play here. Ah, Canale's book on this is fantastic, and I could, I could just spend hours talking about this, but friends, we're building on a totally different foundation. We are building on a totally different foundation. This is us. This is us. This is our foundation. Are we going to be at odds? Are we going to be at odds with liberal Protestantism? Of course we are. Because our foundation is totally different. We take a natural, normal, literal, grammatical, historical reading of Scripture. Our basic philosophical, epistemological, theological foundation is at totally at odds with theirs. Of course our conclusions are going to be different. But let us be happy that our conclusions are different. Let us be proud that our conclusions are different. We, we, God didn't put us on earth to, be, uh, to do a popular work, but to do an important work. Uh, we should proclaim what we believe. We should be unashamed about it. We should stand up and say, this is what we believe. These are the reasons why we believe what we believe. And we believe they are compelling. 
doesn't mean we have to be unkind or ungracious or, or uh, we're going to be deferential, we're going to be gracious, we're going to be very, very understanding, but fundamentally, this is where we stand. This is what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, to stand on Scripture. Right here, this is where we're going to stand. Now, does that mean we have all the answers? Not even close. This is why we have institutions like the BRI and the seminary, and this is why we have many scholars who are researching and pastors and others who are researching to try and better understand. I tell you, early on in my ministry, I had a very well-known person. I don't want to quote him here up front. But he wrote to me and he said, David, do not strive to be a denominational apologist. He said, be a biblical apologist. And you know what? I totally resonate with that. Because fundamentally, every one of us in this room, our commitment is to Scripture primarily and to the church secondarily. In the sense that our commitment, our ecclesiastical commitment to the church flows out of the fact that we believe they're standing on Scripture. God save us from ever getting to the place where we stand in defense of our institutions and in defense of our positions and in defense of our various uh, 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 edifices that we have built over and against what Scripture teaches. God save us from this institutional drift. This is us. This is who we are. We stand on Scripture. Do we know everything? No, we don't know everything, but we know a few things. And the few things that we know, we're going to stand on those things. Now, we're not going to, we are not going to divide the church over non-essential issues. We are going to adhere to the basic Protestant axiom in essentials, absolute unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. We're not going to divide the church over drums. God save us from that foolishness. It's not going to happen. We are not going to divide the church over cheese. That is not going to happen. God himself ate cheese with Abraham under the tree, by the way. We are not going to divide the church. I, I could go on here. I could go on here. We are not going to divide the church over non-essential issues. We are going to stand on the essentials, and we are going to allow liberally, liberty and liberality in the actual meaning of the word to those who might not see everything just as we see it. Praise the Lord. Praise God that we're not, we're not striving for, for uniformity. We're striving for unity, and they are different. God save us from absolute uniformity. We're striving for unity, unity in Scripture. And let us, be, let us be bold enough to stand on what we do know and let us be humble enough and gracious enough to say what we don't know and to allow a little flexity, to allow a little on those non-essential issues. But we cannot bend on the Sabbath. This is non-negotiable. This is who we are. I mean, what, what good would a Seventh-day Adventist be that didn't stand on the, on the Sabbath? We're not bending on that. It's just non-negotiable. We can't bend on the soon second coming of Jesus. We're Adventists. We, 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 we can't bend on that. That's a non-negotiable for us. We can't bend on sola scriptura. Not prima scriptura, by the way. Sola scriptura. We can't bend on that. We're committed to sola scriptura. We can't bend on, we can't bend on the state of the dead. We cannot embrace anthropological dualism. We're going to stand on biblical monism. We're going to stand where scripture says. We can't bend on the sanctuary. Our whole history is tied up with the sanctuary. What are we going to do with Daniel? What are we going to do with Hebrews? We've got to stand here. We're going to stand on this place. On some of these other issues, hey, let's debate it. Let's discuss it. Let's sit down at the table and we can all be Seventh-day Adventists. We can all be Seventh-day Adventists and we can, you know, you can bring your cottage cheese to the potluck and you can bring your vegan sour cream. We're going to get together. We're going to be Seventh-day Adventists, right? But there are some things that we cannot ignore. We cannot walk away from. We cannot pretend like they're not there. They're there. And it's what makes us who we are. This is our foundation. Let's not pretend like it's not. Let's not curry the favor of the world and try to in import and incorporate various materialistic and liberal views just to, to what? To, to look more credible? Who are we trying to please? God or man? Several years ago, I had the privilege of preaching in a, a situation, and I, I invented a word, which I'm sometimes accused of doing, but I don't think I do it. Um, but this time, I, I, I freely, volitionally created a word, and I put together the words God and audience. And I came up with the word Godians. I want to live my life for the Godians, not for the audience. Who cares what the world says? Who cares what the audience says? I want my life to be lived for an audience of one, the Godians. In the inimitable words of Ellen White, we should do what is right because it is right and leave the consequences with God.
Beloved, I want to close with that. Who are we today? In your own personal life, who are you today? It's one thing to believe the basic pillars of the church. It's one thing to believe the basic pillars of Scripture. But who are you today? Jesus gave three things. Three things, he said, for the man that has his house built on a foundation. Number one, whoever comes to me. That's what he said. We first got to come to Jesus. Can you say amen to that? We got to come to Jesus. And he told us how right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He told us how. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We've got to come as we are because we can't come to God as we aren't. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, all things are naked to God. Let's not clothe ourselves with our intellectual, artificial, cerebral fig leaves. God sees through it. We've got to come to him. Jesus says, whoever comes to me, number one. Number two, and hears my words. Now here's a personal appeal to you. I love to read. I'm a reader. I'm just wired that way. Some of you not so much. That's okay. For those of you that are readers, I want to appeal to you, if you're not already doing it, make the word of God the centerpiece of your reading. It doesn't mean that it, you have to read it more than the combined total of all the other things you're reading, but, but, but read scripture. Saturate your mind in the great truths of scripture. Memorize those passages. Get to know those passages. Inculcate those passages. In the words of Jesus, eat his flesh and drink imbibe scripture and the most I just want to appeal to you and do the same for the spirit of prophecy in the words of Dwight Nelson they used to be the red books now they're the unread books take those books <laughs> take those books off of the shelf those books are rich those books are valuable read steps to Christ every single year where would we be without that book read those books and I read other books as well but where is my priority I'm not a killjoy either. I like to have a little fun. I'm a fan of basketball. Is that okay? <laughs> I love basketball. I like to play it, you know. I mean, you can tell, right? <laughs> but I like to watch it. I'm a basketball fan. I enjoy it. I, I like to, I, I'm, if the playoffs are getting ready to come up, I'm excited about it. But, but I want to be careful. I want to be careful that, that the sum total of time that I spend reading the various writers on ESPN doesn't even begin to approach the time that I have in Scripture. Are we together on that? Jesus says, whoever comes to me, we've got to come as we are. Number two, whoever hears my words. Let's hear the words. For some of you, that's going to mean turning off the television. It's going to mean that. I'm sorry to be so forward, but, but the other day I turned on the television. Praise the Lord, I do not have a television that's connected to anything in my home. It's a wasteland. I was just saying to Jared, who's here from Australia, uh, Hope TV, it's a wasteland. This is not entertainment. I cannot believe the things that people are watching. Much of what's on television today would have been a rated R movie when I was a boy. And I'm 38. I'm a baby. I'm not going to the doctor for the regular checkups. <laughs> right? The point is this, friends. I'm not going to say all television is bad. What I'm going to say is that most of it is bad. And you need to be so saturated in Scripture that you know the difference. That you can discern. We have, a, we, have a, we have a foundation so that when the whole world begins to shift around us, and Lord Jesus, is it shifting culturally? Oh, I could give examples of that. If I would have told my dad when I was 17 years old, if I would have gone to my dad and said, Dad, you know, my dad spent 36 years in the military. He had an index finger about that long. Boy. If I would have gone to my dad at 17 and said, you know, Dad, I'm gay. He would have said, uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Just, no way, it's just not, no, that, no, you're not. If I went to my dad today, I'm a married man. This is my dad, unbeliever. Unbeliever, but a wonderful godly, not a godly man, but a wonderful, nice man. If I would go to my dad today and say, dad, I'm gay, he would, he'd be like, I want to support you, son. That's who you are. And I have a, I'm married with kids. What, how did that happen? Huh, let me tell you, man. I'll tell you what happened. The whole earth, right, just shifted on this issue. Right? Everything shifted. That's why we cannot gauge ourselves. We can't gauge ourselves by looking to the left and saying, okay, we're going to stay equidistant from the left and equidistant from the right. God save us from that kind of centrism. That's political centrism. We don't want to stay equidistant from the left and equidistant from the right. We just want to stay on what Scripture says. Because the left may shift left and the right may shift left. And if we stay centrist politically, then we might be away from Scripture. Does that make sense? Uh, we're not, we don't want to be centrists. We want to be biblical. B 
biblical. This is what we want to be, biblical. Amen. So, beloved, we come to Jesus, we hear his words because the world around us is shifting and it's only going to get worse. And the words of uh, Richard O'Phil, to quote him again, he said, if you've ever wondered what the last days would look like, this is it. This is what it looks like. It's more insidious, it's more subtle, it's more nuanced than we had anticipated. Let's be honest. It's more nuanced, it's more subtle, which is why we've got to have something that grounds us, something that's non-negotiable. Stay here, stay here. The last thing Jesus says, whoever hears, whoever comes to me, hears my words and does them. At some point, at some point, we've got to put, at some point, we've got to put some legs on our lessons and some feet on our faith. At some point, what, what comes here into the mind has to make its way down to the fingers. In actual ministry to actual people, people in our homes, people in our neighborhoods, we have to be reaching out to people. It's all about people, friends. One of the reasons that I keep preaching to non-Adventists is, is very simple. Jesus told me to do it. I love people, and if I didn't, I'm afraid that I would forget how to speak the language. And let me just utter just the, the slightest word here to, to those of you who have been very deep in Adventism your whole life. Be careful that you don't become unable to speak the language of people who aren't like you. If we can't speak their language, we can't meet them. We can't talk to them. We can't interact with them. If we are so insular and so parochial, if all of your friends are Seventh-day Adventists, something's wrong. I'm just opening my heart to you here. I I've been in New Zealand. I go play rugby with the boys. I've got to. Because they're not going to come to my Bible study. I've got to go play rugby with them. I love it, by the way. I'm terrible at it. I love it. But I, I'm among them. I'm among them. I like to go fly fishing with, with people. I hope that's okay. I don't eat them. I just play tug of war with them. <laughs> I want to be among those people. I want, to be, I, want to, I want to be among the surfers. I want to be in the lineup. I want to be among people. Friends, I appeal to you. I just open my heart to you to, to not become so insular in your Adventism, that you forget how to speak the language of those people in the 7-Eleven, on the plane, or in the 1040 window. We've got to stay connected to people. Amen? Amen. So, don't be a foundationless house. Don't be a houseless foundation. We need both. We need an epistemological bottom, and Scripture is it. Scripture is it. And we need a life of actual ministry, reaching out to people, loving Jesus, real time, in real prayer, and real Bible study. And I cannot think of a better way to conclude the message that God has given me to, to, to say to you than by reading this statement. It was 15 years ago, 15 years ago that I read The Great Controversy, purple-haired punk rocker. Purple-haired punk rocker, no interest in God or the things of God, very unaware of, of any, uh, uh, just didn't even know what a Seventh-day Adventist was. But over the years, God has done something wonderful in my life. He's doing something wonderful in your life. And for me, it's very full circle that I would be here standing at the General Conference 15 years later. And, and here's my message in a nutshell. Everything else we've preached, and this is what I want to leave you with. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only, as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms, revival, reformation. I don't, want to re I don't want to reform to conservatism. I want to reform to biblical truth. I got a letter recently from a person in another conference entity. He wrote me a letter. He said, Dave, we're going to have you come speak at our events, but we want you, uh, you know, we know you're a little right of center, I want to know if you could come back toward the center for, for this particular event. I wrote it back. I said, I think you're misinformed. I'm neither right of center nor left of center. I'm just an Adventist. Just an Adventist. Just an Adventist. Friends, let's, let's not strive for conservatism or liberalism. Let's just strive for biblical fidelity. God has not called us to originality. He's called us to fidelity. Satan was the most original being that ever existed, by the way. 
apart from God. He strove for originality, and he got it. And look at where we are. God has called us to fidelity, not to originality. Personal uniqueness, no problem. The opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, which includes, by the way, even the church, our church, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one or all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against a point of religious faith. Before accepting, and some of you know this, before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand, what is it? A plain, thus saith the Lord in its support. Friends, I want to be one of those people who at the end of time, come what may, come what may, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. I want to be one of those people that's hanging on to something that's not going to shake. And I want to be a member of a church, and God help us, to be a church that's clinging to that which cannot shake. Amen? Amen. Be wise men. Be wise men.